Greetings and welcome to Pre-Calculus, Graphs and Functions. In this lesson, we're going to concentrate on inverse functions. Okay, let's jump in and start talking about inverse functions. So the first thing we need to talk about is what is a one-to-one -one function? Because if you're dealing with a function, that's one thing. If you're dealing with a one-to-one -one function, then the original function will have an inverse function. Okay, so one to one, all that means is that if you evaluate this function, we'll just call it f, at two different x values, they do not equal the same value. So if x1 does not equal x2, then when you evaluate the function at x1, it will not equal the same thing as if you evaluate it at, as x2. In short, Every single x goes to a separate y, and every single y came from a separate x. That is what's called a one-to-one. -one. So a line is a really good um, example of a one-to-one. -one. As long as that line is not vertical or horizontal, then it is a one-to-one -one function. Parabolas have problems because even if it opens up or opens down, uh, you can have two x values that go to the same y value. So that's a problem. A parabola is not a one-to-one -one function. So we'll figure out what's one-to-one -one as we go along, but pretty much every single x has only one y it can go to. So let's look at that kind of in a picture format. The domain of our function, let's say, is x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and the range is y1, y2, y3, y4, y5, and every single x goes to a separate y. And if that's the case, then this is a one-to-one -one function. Let's, took a, lay it, let's look at another example. x1 goes to y1, x2 goes to y2, x3 goes to y2, x4 goes to x, uh, y4, and x5 goes to y5. The problem is you have two different x's going to the same y, and therefore it's not a one-to-one. -one. It is a function, it's just not a one-to-one -one function. And then lastly, let's look, take a look at um, this one, where we have the domain of x1, x2, x3, x4, and we have the range, x1 goes to y1, x2 goes to y2 and y3, x3 goes to y4, and x4 goes to y5. Now this last one is not a one-to-one -one function because it even fails to be a function because x2 goes to do different y values and therefore this last example is not even a function. So one-to-one -one function, every single x goes to one and only one, one y and one y came from one and only one x. Not a one-to-one -one function, that's when you have two different x values going to the same y or not a one-to-one -one function and indeed not even a function when you have an x value being able to go to two different y values. Now, just like we have in testing a function, we have the vertical line test. We actually have a horizontal line test for a one-to-one. -one. A one-to-one -one function will pass a horizontal line test. Now, to even have a chance of being a one-to-one -one function, it had to be a function. So this means it has already passed the vertical line test. And if your horizontal line does not pass more than one point at any time, <coughs> pardon me, on the graph, then it is a one-to-one -one function. Additionally, if there is some horizontal line that can intersect more than one point, then it's not a one-to-one. -one. So it has to pass the vertical line test and it has to pass the horizontal line test. Let's take a, a look at some examples and try and see if these functions are lined along, uh, are one to one functions. We have first option f of x equals 2x plus 5. Second, g of x equals x squared plus 1. h of x equals 2 times the square root of x. And we'll go through these one by one and to see if each of these can can pass the one-to-one -one property. And we'll actually do it a couple different ways. Sometimes we can just do it logically. Otherwise, we can do it algebraically. And then lastly, we can actually graph it and use our horizontal line test to see if this indeed is a one-to-one -one function. 
So let's look at a. Now here's the logical approach. f of x equals 2x plus 15 is a line. And all lines are one to one as long as f of x is not a vertical line and therefore not a function. So a vertical line is not a function. And if f of x is a horizontal line, then although it is a function, it doesn't pass, uh, every single x value goes to the same y value. And therefore, again, is not a one-to-one -one function. A vertical line fails to be a function, and therefore, if it's not a function, it's not a one-to-one -one function. A horizontal line, all the x's go to the same y, so since all x's go to the same y, then that's not a one-to-one -one function. So if you see a line, you can immediately say, all lines are one-to-one, -one, except in these two cases, a vertical line or a horizontal line. Those are not one-to-one -one functions. So logically, we know this f of x equals 2x plus 5 is indeed a one-to-one -one function because that is not the equation of horizontal line. Now, if you don't remember, a vertical line is where x equals a value, and a horizontal line is where y equals a value. And A and B are just real numbers. So as long as it's not set up like that, and it's not, it is a line, and therefore all lines are one-to-one. -one. All right, the second approach is actually looking at this algebraic approach. And the algebraic approach is we're going to see if it fits that definition of, well, for every x1 and x2 that don't equal each other, when you evaluate the function at x1 and when you evaluate the function at x2, they're not going to equal each other either. So let's suppose the opposite. Let's suppose that our function at x1 equals our function at x2. Well then, we have f of x1 is 2x1 plus 5, and our f of x2 is 2 times x2 plus 5. But remember, we're assuming that these two things equal one another. So we're going to say 2x1 plus 5 equals 2x2 plus 5. And I'm going to solve this. So I'm going to just subtract 5 from both sides. We get 2x1 equals 2x2. Divide by 2 to each side, and we end up getting x1 equals x2. And if that's the case, this had to be the same number. And therefore, there is no other number it can be. So it implies this f of x1 equaling f of x2 implies that x1 equals x2. Therefore, the function is 1 to 1. There's no other x value that you could get this result. The two x values have to equal one another. And that fits the definition. Same problem, but this time let's take the geometric approach. We're going to actually sketch this out and we're going to use a horizontal line test um, to see if it is a one-to-one -one function. But first we need to see, is it indeed a function at all? So I'm going to see if it passes the vertical line test first and then we'll do a horizontal line test. So here we go. Is it a function? That means if any horizontal line I put up here does it only touch one point? And so far, vertical line test, yes, indeed, every single, if I could get that pretty vertical, um, every single point that this ruler touched, it was only hitting one point at a time. And therefore, it is a function. Now we have to see, is it a one-to-one -one function? So instead of vertical, I'm going to move it horizontal, and then I'm going to bring it down horizontally, and we can see we're cruising along the line, just one point, one point, one point, Let's see if I can get that straight, one point, all the way down the line, I only hit one point. And so therefore, not only is it a function, it is indeed a one-to-one -one function. So that's the geometric approach. So first approach was a logical approach. You kind of reason it out. Well, it's a line and it's not vertical, it's not horizontal, and uh, therefore it's a function and it's a one-to-one -one function. Secondly, you can solve it algebraically. And third, you can look at it geometrically and see indeed if it passes the horizontal line test.
Now, not always can we just kind of logic things out. So we are going to roll back and rely on our algebraic approach quite a, for the rest of the problem set. Let's take a look at B. G of X equals X squared minus one. And we're going to, I'm going to look at it logically first. Okay, so G of X equals X squared uh, minus one. This is a parabola that opens either upwards or downwards because we have the squaring on the X. Now, I honestly don't care how it opens up, if it opens up down, upward or downward, but just the shape of a parabola means that I'm gonna have two different X values going to the same Y value. And because of that, they open up or down. They are functions, but they're not one to fun one functions. Parabolas that open up or down are not our functions, but not one to one. Because if you can imagine the it, there are two values that when you pass, there are two values of X that goes to the same Y values. That's just what parabolas are. So logically I have one X value going to a Y and I have another X value going to a Y that fails to be a one to one. And so logically we can just say, Hey, this is not a one to one function because it's parabola that opens upwards or downwards. But sometimes that's not good enough. We need to look at this algebraically. Let's again suppose that g of x1 equals g of x2. Then, well, we have g of x1 is x1 squared minus 1. g of x2 is x2 squared minus 1. And remember, our assumption is these two things equal one another. So let's set the two functions equal to one another x1 uh, squared minus 1 equals x2 squared minus 1. I'm going to add 1 to both sides. And I get x1 squared equals x2 squared. But I'm going to take the square root of the left-hand side, meaning I need plus or minus on the right-hand side before I take the square root. And that ends up being x1 equals plus or minus x2. Well, we're in this situation where, hey, our x one value didn't go to just one value, it went to two different values, the negative and the positive. And therefore we have a problem, it's going to two different points. And therefore x, uh, g of x is not a one to one. We are not allowed to have this doubling up. If this said x1 equals x2, we're good, we're a one, one, on one, a one to one. But because our x1 goes to two different x2 values, this is not a one to one function. Now it doesn't tell me if it is a function, it just tells me it's not a one-to-one -one function. All right, let's look at this geometrically. We're going to play the same game. We have to figure out number one, is it a function? Number two, is it a one-to-one -one function? So figuring out if it's a function, I'm going to use the vertical line test. And at every point on this parabola, I do only pass one and only one point. This ruler is only passing one point. And in fact, I am going to color a point on my ruler. And I'm going to try and follow along the parabola. So you can see it is only hitting one point everywhere on that ruler. It's only hitting one point point. And therefore, yes, it is a function. But let's do the horizontal line test. Okay, and I'm going to start from the bottom. At this point right here, I am hitting one and only one point. But anywhere else, I hit two points. So I hit a point. Let's see if I can do it. Uh, right there. Hard to do it with the camera. And I think right there is my other point. I hit two points, not just one point. And because of that, the moment I hit more than one point, it is no longer a one-to-one -one function. So geometrically, you were just looking for the horizontal line test, but I did need to make sure it was function first because there are some fun there are some relations that will pass the horizontal line test but will not pass the vertical line test. So therefore, it's still not a one-to-one -one function. It has to pass both the vertical and the horizontal. Let's take a look at that third one. H of x equals two times the square root of 
x. Now I'm going to jump to algebraically. We're going to suppose that there is some x of x1, h of x1 equals h of x2. Then again, let's break it down. Let's throw in an x1, and we get 2 times the square root of x1. That, sh that uh, and then h of x2 equals 2 times square root of x2. That means these two things equal one another. And we have 2 times the square root of x x1 equals 2 times the square root of x2. Let's solve. T let's go ahead and, and divide by 2, and we get square root of x1 equals the square root of x2. I'm going to square both sides, and we get x1 equals x2. And because the only way that we could have h of x1 equaling h of x2 is when x1 and x2 equal one another, this indeed is a one-to-one -one function. Now geometrically, let's do that same thing. We're going to graph it, and we're going to see, is this a one-to-one -one function? Make some room there. There we go. Well, it passes the vertical line test. Right? All along there, it passes the vertical line test, so it is a function. And now let's see if it passes the horizontal. And just looking at where the ruler crosses that function, it's in one place at any one time. And therefore, this is a one-to-one -one function. If we do indeed have a one-to-one -one function, then our function has an inverse. It has an inverse function, meaning usually we plug in an x and we get out a y. Our inverse, if we plug in a y, we will get out the x value it came from. We denote it with an f with a power of a negative 1, okay? f to the power of 1. We do say the inverse of f of y equals x. And this is if and only if y equals f of x. Okay. So we have a function. We plug in an x, we get a y. If our inverse exists, if we plug in the y, we will get back to the x. An inverse undoes everything a function does. Yeah, I know it's worded a little weird. But a function does some stuff to a value, and the inverse will undo that stuff so we can get back to the original value. For example, um, the inverse of addition is subtraction. So I can have a func function that says x plus 3. My inverse of that is going to be x minus 3, or I should say y minus 3. It undoes what happened to the result. So let's pretend that x is 2. 2 plus 3 is 5. My result is 5. But if I take 5 and do minus 3, I get right back to 2. So an inverse function will undo everything that happened during the function stage. The domain of, function, of our function is our range of our inverse, and our range of our function is the domain of the inverse. They swap positions. So domain of our function is the range of our inverse. Range of our function is the domain of our inverse. They swap positions. You can think of it as, as this. The domain x's of our f's of our function is the y's of our inverse. You can think of it like that, but they just swap positions. I do want to warn you, though, that this power of negative 1 does not mean that, you know, if you had 2 to the negative 1, that would be 1 half. That is not a power. That is a, a notation meaning inverse. So it does not mean 1 over f of x. These two things are totally different. There is a way to write this. It's a little confusing, and since we're not going to deal with it right now, I thought I would just leave that out. Let's concentrate on f of negative 1 of x is meaning the inverse only. So uh, I will say the inverse of f, and I won't say f at negative 1. Okay. Now let's look at an example relating the values of a function to its inverse. 
we have to make the assumption that f is a one-to-one -one function. If f is not a one-to-one -one function, it does not have an inverse. So we have to make this assumption that our function is actually one-to-one. -one. If our function evaluated at 3 is 5, we want to find the inverse of 5. Secondly, if our inverse function uh, at negative 1 equals 7, then we want to find our function at 7. Now I'm going to run through this algebraically and then I'm going to show you a shortcut. So here we go. By definition, using the definition of what an inverse function is, the inverse of f of y equals f if and only if our y equals f of x. Now looking at a, Let's let our x value be 3 and our y value be 5. I'm going to plug them into the definition. That means that our y is our function evaluated at our x value. If and only if, that's what this IFF stands for. I'm not going to keep writing out if and only if. If and only if our inverse function at 5, right? equals our x value at 3. So we know our inverse function at 5 equals 3. Let's look at b. Let's let our y equal negative 1 and our x be 7. Why am I choosing that? Because I'm looking at the inverse, so this is our y value and this is our x value. And therefore again, rolling back to the definition, our f our, our inverse of f at negative 1 equals 7 if and only if negative 1 equals our function at 7. And therefore our function evaluated at 7 equals negative 1 and that's what we're looking for. Our function of 7, f of 7. Here's the other way you can look at it. The I think what's easier is when you have an inverse function your x's and y's flip. Remember, the domain is the range and the range is your domain. And therefore, if my function evaluated at 3 is 5, then the inverse evaluated at 5 has to be 3. These two things switch positions. Our uh, inverse function evaluated at negative 1 equals 7. Therefore, flip these over, our function evaluated at 7 has to be negative 1. So they change positions. Our x becomes um, our y and our y becomes our x. Or I should say the input becomes the output and the output becomes the input. I don't want to stay with x's and y's. I want to talk about inputs and, and outputs. So our output, our input and our output, therefore our output becomes our input and therefore our input here becomes our output. So that's what it equals. Flip positions. Let's talk about some properties here with our inverse function. Let's let f be a one-to-one -one function. Then we know this inverse of f evaluated at f of x is actually x. And this is for every single x in the domain of our function. Additionally, if we take our function and we put our inverse function in it, um, and we evaluate it at x, it will equal x for every x in the domain of our inverse function. This is composing functions. So you can write it as uh, inverse f of x, or you can say, um, you know, hard to say it really easily, but you are composing functions. You're putting in f of x inside of the inverse function and it will always equal x. That's how you know if if indeed um, the inverse function is indeed the inverse function of the function. <laughs> Meaning if I'm given g of x and I'm giving an f, and f of x and I'm trying to figure out if g of x is the inverse of f of x, then I'm going to compose my functions. And if they indeed equal x, then I know they were inverses of one another. So let's take a, a look at an example. Okay, so there it is in composite notation. But let's run through an example so you can see it. We've got f of x equals 2x plus 3. 
and we have g of x equals x minus 3 over 2. I want to see if these are inverse functions. I want to see if g is the inverse of f. And to do that, I'm going to compose my functions. Whatever g of x is, I'm going to place it into f of x and figure out what it is. If that equals x, that's just one half of it. Then I'm going to place f of x inside g of x. And wherever there is an x, I'm going to place this 2x plus 3. If this also ends up being x, then I know I have inverse functions. So let's try it out. Let's find um, our composed functions, f of g and f of f. All right, f of g of x, that's going to be our function f evaluated at, evaluated at g of x. Well, g of x is x minus 3 plus uh, over 2. So inside my f function, wherever I see an x, right here, I'm going to put this value of x minus 3 over 2. Just using algebra, the 2's cancel out. I've got x minus 3 plus 3. This equals x. We're halfway there. Now we're going to do the reverse order. We're going to put f of x inside g of x. And once I put that together, I'm going to evaluate g of f of x, but f of x is 2x plus 3. Here's my x right here. I'm going to put the 2x plus 3 here. And I get 2x plus 3 minus 3 all over 2. Well, the plus 3 and minus 3 will go away, and I've got 2x over 2, which equals x because our comp composition of f of g is x and our composition of g of f is x, g is the inverse of f, okay? Because these two facts hold. Once I compose them, they both popped out just in x and therefore g of x is the inverse of f. And f is the inverse of g. It works both ways. It's not just one way here. f is the inverse of g. g is the inverse of f. Okay, well sometimes we're not given just two functions. We might be giving one function and then we have to find an inverse. So as long as our function is a one-to-one -one function, then it does indeed have a uh, inverse function. We're gonna suppose that this point AB is on the graph of f. And that actually means, so we evaluate f at the value of a, we spit out b. So the inverse is when we plug in b and we spit out an a. So this point ba is a point in the inverse. Okay? They swapped positions. So the point ab is in the function graph, and the point ba is in the inverse function graph. And indeed, when we look at it, these two points are symmetric about the line y equals x. So there's a diagonal line that goes up our graph, and these points will be symmetric about that point. Now, that is part of a property that we have, the symmetry property of graphs. The graph of f and the graph of the inverse of f are one-to-one -one functions, then they are going to be symmetric around the line y equals x. Okay. Now let's actually look at an example. Let's find the graph of f of uh, uh, the inverse of f from our graph of our function. So here we go. Here is our function. Right? That's all I'm given. I'm not given an equation. I'm just giving three points that are connected. And my f of x point is negative 3, 5 down here negative 1, 2, right here, and 4, 3, right here. Now I know my inverse function is where these points are swapped positions. So my points will be negative 5, 3, so let me put that on here, negative 5, 3, negative 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, Next point will be 2, negative 1. So 1, 2, negative 1. Next point was 4, 3, and I'm going to flip places. So 3, 4. 
one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Okay, now I'm going to connect those dots. Now indeed, it is symmetrical around the line y equals x. Let me get, drag out a different color. I hope this shows up. So here's my line y equals x. And you can see it is perfectly symmetrical on one side of the line as it is on the other. These points just change places on that are symmetric around this line. Okay, so all you need to do is change the position of your x's and y's, flip them, and plot them when you're given a graph like this. Graph, and we still need to find um, the equation for our inverse function, and we're not given a graph. Then we're going to have to manipulate our original function to find f uh, uh, the inverse of our function. So here are four steps that we're going to do. One, let's go ahead and replace our f of x, our function notation, with y. Then we're going to interchange our x's and y's. We're going to swap places that wherever you see an x, you're going to write a y. Wherever you see y, you're going to write an x. Then you're going to solve the equation for y. Once you're done there, you're going to replace the y with the note back to the function notation, but now we have the inverse of x, inverse of f, and not the just the regular function. So let's go through and find the inverse of 3x minus 4 following these steps. First step, we're going to get rid of this f of x notation, and we're going to put in the y. So y f of x equals 3x minus 4 becomes y equals 3x minus 4. Second step, we're going to swap positions of all of our x's and y's. So 3x becomes 3y, y becomes x. Now we need to solve this equation for the variable y. I'm going to add 4 to both sides. We get x plus 4 equals 3y. I'm going to divide by 3 because I don't want 3 y's, I want single y. And we get x plus 4 over 3 equals y. Last step, I'm going to change this y and put it into the inverse notation of a function. So first and foremost, I am going to switch sides just because I really do like my y on the left. So y equals x plus 4 over 3. And now I'm going to change it to back to function notation. But remember, we have found the inverse f. Um, so we're going to have to say the inverse of f of x is x plus 4 all over 3. And that's it. Four steps. Get rid of the f of x. Change it into a y. Swap positions of your x and y. Solve for y and then rewrite it in function notation to let us know that it is indeed the inverse function. Now unfortunately not all of them are that simple to solve. So let's look at a little bit more complex. f of x equals x plus 1 over x plus 2. And we need to keep in mind that our domain does not include 2 because 2 minus 2 is 0. So we do need to keep that in mind when we are ultimately solving for our inverse function. First step, let's get rid of this f of x and write it as a y. Next step, anywhere you see an x, write a y. Anywhere you see an y, write an x. So we're changing positions. This is now x equals y plus 1 all over y plus 2. All right. Third step, we're going to have to solve for y. The problem is I've got y's in the numerator. I've got y's in the denominators. I just don't have one y running around. I have a couple of y's running around. First things first, let's get rid of that denominator. Just makes it a little bit more difficult to work with. So I'm going to multiply both sides by x minus 2, this denominator. 
both sides by that denominator. By doing that, I'm going to get rid of the denominator on the right, and I'll have a little bit of math to do on the left. All right. So I'm trying to get all my y's to one side. So I'm going to move this minus 2x. So I said x times y is xy. x times negative 2 is negative 2x. Because this value, this negative 2x, has no y's connected to it, I'm going to move it to the right. And this y, I'm going to move to the left. So let's do this one step at a time. I'm going to add 2x to both sides. We get xy equals y plus 2x plus 1. Now I'm going to get rid of this y by subtracting it. But the problem is I can't combine these. These are not like terms, so I can't combine them. But I do have x y minus y equals 2x plus 1. On the left hand side, I want to factor out the y. Okay. So if I factor out the y from the x, I'm left with x. If I factor out the y on the second one, I get minus 1. So I have y times x minus 1 equals 2x plus 1. I'm going to solve for y. So I need to get rid of this blob. So I'm going to divide by that blob, x minus 1. I know, very scientific terms here. Divide each side by that, and we are left with y equals 2x plus 1 all over x minus 1. The only thing we need to do is rewrite this in function notation. So we have our, our inverse function is x, uh, 2x plus 1 over x minus 1, where its domain does not include 1, because you don't want a 1 here. Okay. So our domain of our original function was all values except for 2. Our domain of our inverse function is all values except for 1. x cannot equal 1. Now remember when I said the domain of the function is the range of the inverse, and the range of the function is the domain of its inverse. So sometimes with one-to-one -one functions, it's very hard to figure out the range. But if you find the inverse, find its domain, that is the range of the function. So I know my domain of my function is everything but 2. And my range of my original function is everything but 1. My domain of my inverse is everything but 1. And it, the range of the inverse is everything but 2. So those two things are meaningful for both the inverse and the functions. OK, so let me summarize what I just said about the domain and function. So here's our original function, x plus 1 over x minus 2, where our domain was everything but negative 2. And our inverse, we found out, was 2x plus 1 over x minus 1. And its domain is everything but 1 because that causes the denominators to be 0. So our domain of our function is all x's such that x does not equal 2. And in set notation, that's negative infinity to 2, not including 2, union with 2 to infinity, not including 2. The range is the domain of the inverse. And therefore, my domain of my inverse are all x's such that x does not equal 1, or in I'll let you read the set notation. And therefore, my range of my original function is all x's such that x does not, oops, I missed my little slashy symbol, does not equal 1. Okay. Now let's actually run through an example to find the inverse of a function. Here we have our uh, function, g of x, and that equals x squared minus 1. And we're going to say uh, x is greater than or equal to 0. So we know it's a 1 to 1 function because we're stipulating what x's can be. If we didn't do this, then, well, that's a parabola and we have problems. It's a function but not a 1 to 1. We're controlling it to be a 1 to 1 function. First step, let's write it with y notation. And I, you'll notice that I'm still dragging this along. Okay, I'm still dragging that along. Okay, now, because our x's and y changes positions, our y is now greater than or equal to 0. 
That's step two. Step three, let's solve for y. Add one to both sides. We get x plus one equals uh, y squared. We know y is greater than or equal to zero. We're gonna take the square root of both sides and because y is only greater than zero, we're not gonna use the plus and minus because we're not gonna have the minuses. Remember, y is actually greater than zero, so we don't have the plus or minus. And therefore, y equals the square root of x plus one. And writing it back in function notation, we get the inverse of g of x equals the square root of x plus one. And we do still need to make sure that we are not breaking any rules. Our x value is, our, uh, our y values cannot be, are greater than zero and our x values are greater than zero. Okay, now let's do one more last example for this. I know when we're working in the abstract and we're just using these letters and, and writing it in function notation and all that, it doesn't seem to be relevant to the real world around us. But math is incredibly relevant. So let's take a look at a real life example. And this is going to be water pressure on underwater devices. You know, it has an effect. Now there's a whole big long story in our textbook. It's at the very beginning of the chapter. I'm not gonna worry about the whole entire story. I'm gonna give you some facts. Number one, pressure, P, is measured in pounds per square inch, PSI. And this PSI depends on how deep you are, the depth you are in the water in feet below the surface. And this is going to be our D value. We have this equation, P equals 5d over 11 plus 15 and although this is a beautiful function that's great it might be a little bit difficult to solve for d it might be a little bit complex so if i gave you a pressure let's say a pressure gauge on a diving bell breaks and shows the reading of 1800 psi i get the fact that you can plug this in and you could probably solve for D. It's a little bit complex, but you can solve for D. But what if we find the inverse function of this? Now I'm not gonna write it quite in inverse function notation. I'm gonna skip to the fact that, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and just solve this for the depth. I could say uh, X and Y flip places and then um, solve, but I'm going to go ahead and leave it in the notation of P and D. So let's see, let's solve for our depth. First things first, I'm going to multiply everything by 11. That way I can get rid of this denominator. Let's face it, we don't really like to have fractions. So let's get rid of the fraction by multiplying everything by 11. If I do that, I get 11 P equals 5 D time or plus 165. Now again, I'm looking to solve this for D. I'm going to subtract 165 from both sides. I get 11P minus 165 equals 5D. Let's divide each side by 5. I can reduce this a little bit on the left and I get 11 over 5P minus 33 equals D. Now, when I throw in the 1800, it's a little bit easier to figure out that, oh, okay, our depth is 3,927 feet deep. Now I get the fact you didn't have to do that. You could have thrown it in and then solved for D using all your algebra skills. But if I had you do several problems, then wouldn't it be easier just to have a function you can throw in the pressure and figure out the D versus solving it complicated wise every single time. That's another good thing about, about having inverse functions is that when your variable is kind of locked inside your equation, if you have the inverse that unlocks it, then that makes it a lot easier to solve. So 11 times 1800 divided by five minus 33 is 3,927 feet the, our diving bell was under the surface. Uh, that's it for this lesson. Until next time, be seeing you.